Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Christine Coker. Uh, she's been with the Mississippi State uh, University Coastal Research and Extension Center for 11 years. Uh, she is the uh, an Associate Research and Extension Professor <coughs> of Urban Horticulture uh, and is a research leader at uh, Beaumont Horticultural Unit in Perry County. Uh, she graduated from the University of Tennessee at Martin in 1996 with a Bachelor of Arts in Biology. Bachelor of Arts in Biology? Really? I, mean, uh, I didn't even know such a thing existed. Bachelor of Arts in Biology. I thought it was always science. Uh, and from uh, Austin, um, Austin P. Uh, P. P. I thought so. State University in 98 with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. She received her PhD in horticulture from Auburn in 2001. Her research interests include commercial vegetation production, high tunnel production, home gardening, green roofs, which is a cool aspect, I love seeing these green roofs, and uh, community food systems. Uh, she currently serves as the board directors for Loaves and Fishes, uh, Soup Kitchen, and uh, Local Food Ministry. Her free time, uh, I can't believe her free time, she enjoys <laughs> yoga, scuba diving, and traveling. She lives with her husband Randy and an English setter, Tiberius. Uh, so this, this is your presentation. If it's okay, I'd like to send my CV to whoever wrote her bio. <laughs> because she came from way more impressive. <laughs> I appreciate the invitation to come. Um, so this was a, a little out of my comfort zone when I got the invitation because um, I'm, an, I'm an ag girl. Um, I work with a lot of farmers. I work with a lot of home gardeners too. Um, and I'm sort of in a unique situation being in agriculture. Um, I work a lot with vegetable production, and I've always sort of looked past the production process to its food. The whole reason I went from biology to horticulture was because I wanted to feed people. And so a lot of times food and agriculture get really separated. Food science is a, under a whole other college at Mississippi State. Um, so sometimes um, we get separated, but I think we should think more together. So it's long been an article of faith among the American people that no one in a land so blessed with plenty should go hungry. Hunger is simply not acceptable in our society. But yet, here we are. So I want to talk a little bit about food security, what that means, and um, I'm going to give you some statistics and that'll be kind of boring, um, but it's more about uh, what they represent. So f food security is really access by people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. This means food that's readily available, readily available and it's uh, nutritionally adequate and safe. And you can acquire this in socially acceptable ways. Dumpster diving behind a restaurant may give you nutritionally adequate food. It may even be safe food. Not socially acceptable. <laughs> food insecurity is limited or uncertain availability of this food. Um, so a lot of times you hear high <coughs> food insecurity or low food security. And so those are the same thing. And then there's hunger, which is completely on its own. This is like physical hunger, that painful sensation caused by lack of food. The current involuntary lack of access to food. This is there is absolutely nothing for you to eat. So this is um, some information I got from an organization called Why Hunger. Um, and this is specific to Mississippi. Ooh, we're number one. Population living in poverty. Um, we're only second place living in extreme poverty. Number one, children living in poverty. Number one, seniors living in poverty. So what about our food insecurity? We rank number three in the number of households that have low or very low food security. And we're tied for fourth for households with very low food security. It's hard to reconcile sometimes that we come from an agricultural state and a big chunk of our economy is from growing food. 
but we're hungry. How does this relate to health? Number one, infant mortality. Number one, obesity. Hey, look, we're way down the scale at number 10 on population without health insurance. That's the bright spot in the statistics I have, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, if you look at it by numbers, not percentages or rankings, almost 600,000 people are food insecure, don't have access to food. Of uh, these people, 27% of these folks aren't even eligible for food assistance. Oops, sorry. And 53% of these people fall below the SNAP threshold. <coughs> um, I won't go into, so SNAP is food stamps, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, and the SNAP threshold is not necessarily the government poverty level. It's 130%. Um, but that's where they come from. So now let's bring it home. The 4th Congressional District. This is us. 20% of the households are food insecure. Almost 145,000 people right here at home. Hungry. And a bunch of them are not eligible for assistance. This is some information that came um, from a large study done by Feeding America. It was a national study, and I've just drawn out some of the information from Mississippi. Feeding America used to be America's second harvest food bank, and everybody's kind of familiar with that. And it's a network comprised of about 80% of all the food banks in the United States. So even though the percentages are not going to be precise, this gives us a good idea of the kind of people who are hungry in our communities. Uh, and just in Mississippi, almost 350,000 people, different, <coughs> not recurring, like the same person comes every week and they get counted 26 times, different people are getting food from the food bank. <coughs> so some characteristics of, of these folks. 8% um, of our hungry people, kids. 17% seniors. 24% are white. 74% are white. Hispanics. Etc. 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 Um, a lot of our hungry people have an unemployment issue. Um, and like I said, a lot of them have incomes that are below the federal poverty level. Out of all those, 3% are homeless. I have found that a lot of people equate hunger and chronic hunger with homelessness. Yeah, it's a problem. If you're homeless, you know, you don't exactly have a kitchen to, you know, throw something in the microwave. But the homeless population is not making up the bulk of hungry people in our community. So um, this is Mississippi clients. 73% are food insecure. 30% have very low <coughs> food security. Um, if you have a kid and you're poor, you are so likely to be food insecure. And then, of course, you have to make those choices. 47% of the people who go to food banks have to choose between food or utilities. 30% have to decide between, do I go to the grocery store or pay the rent or the mortgage? 35% say that they have to choose between getting something to eat or putting gas in the car to get to the job. 42% have to choose between feeding themselves and their family or paying for their medicines or their medical care. And 30% say that they've had to choose between a meal and paying the car payment. It's a sad state of affairs. Clients do receive governmental assistance from, you know, different programs. Um, 
a lot of them are eligible for uh, food stamp benefits, SNAP. Um, with kids, uh, with families that have small kids, about 15% of them get WIC benefits, women, infant, and children. Um, about 49% of um, families that have school age kids, um, 49 to 55% participate in uh, school lunch and breakfast programs. We oftentimes don't think about how important that is. Sometimes school breakfast or school lunch is the only meal a child will see. And if you're like me, you've turned your nose up at many a cafeteria tray. I wish I'd known now that, you know, maybe I should have offered that to, you know, the kid at the next table. And the summer food program is growing in importance. So, um, how does this relate to health? 41% uh, of the households that rely on food pantries have at least one household member that's in poor health. So, the question that I bring to you is, are people hungry because they're poor? Or are people poor because they're hungry? If you don't have food and you're hungry, are you getting up and going to work? Are you getting full productivity? If you're hungry uh, and you're choosing between a meal on the table and your medicines, you know, these are all choices that I hope nobody in this room ever has to make. But we're in very uncertain times, and it very easily could be any one of us. So, 43.6 million people in the U.S. are poor, which is not exactly true, because it's 46.2 million, <laughs> according to the 2010 census. Um, and where persistent poverty comes the erosion of opportunity for a better life. Um, governmental intervention is essential, but so are innovative community-based solutions that help meet these basic needs, and they actually help strengthen the community's social fabric. So um, over 49 million people live in, in, in food insecure households, and diet-related disease has been steadily escalating. And it mirrors the rise of processed food, unnutritious food, and the scarcity of accessibility to these foods. And so we talked a little bit about food deserts. Uh, Dr. Angela Lewis discussed that just a little bit. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a food desert is. Um, a food desert is it's a concentrated <coughs> uh, where there's low access to fresh produce and meat. So communities that she explained that have a liquor store and a convenience store and a Taco Hill and a McDonald's, um, you know, you might can get milk and bread, but you know, you're not going in there to pick up uh, chicken breast. So a lot of times these communities have lots of convenience stores, lots of fast food joints, but where do you go to get food? This is uh, a map of the Gulf Coast. The areas in pink are classified by the USDA <coughs> as food deserts. Now, if you're like me, when you first see this, you are shocked and appalled. Because here on the coast, we're metropolitan, right? Yeah, we have towns all along the highway. We have grocery stores. I mean, we're not out in the sticks. You know, we're pretty well, you know, modernized. Look at these big chunks. These are like areas right in the middle of town that have food deserts. The upper portion of the map going into the rural areas, those are included in this map. There just aren't any food deserts up there. People may live in a rural area and have to drive to a grocery store, but they have a grocery store to drive to. So this is where the ag girl in me comes in. Um, so I do a lot of work with urban horticulture. <coughs> I do a lot of trainings. 
Um, and I meet all kinds of people. Uh, I work with farmers. I work with school children. I work with just people who are interested in saving some money and want to know how to grow something. Um, and it is always an education in both directions. So in these tough economic times, what we're finding is that home gardens are once again really gaining in popularity. People are all about starting their garden. And uh, after the U.S. entered the war in 1917, so we're going way back, uh, Woodrow Wilson called on Americans to contribute to the war effort. And they could do that by planting a vegetable garden. And Americans enthusiastically responded, partially out of patriotism, but mostly from fear of food shortages. At this time, in 1942, um, when victory gardens were really at their height, there were an estimated 18 million separate victory gardens. And in 1943, that grew to 20 million. Abandoned lots, schoolyards, churches, Rockefeller Plaza had a victory garden. Today, there are an estimated 18,000 community gardens. Um, and so these are shared spaces, not home gardens. And um, a lot of these gardens help address the lack of access to fresh produce. So they offer a community strengthening experience, but they also feel a critical need. There's a program by uh, USDA called the People's Garden, and I do a lot of work with um, school groups and some other community groups on establishing People's Garden. The initiative is meant to promote health and wellness, help the environment, create teaching opportunities, enable social, cultural expectations, foster pride, all the things that gardening does. Um, it's a really great initiative. Uh, I like the name the People's Garden instead of the People's Gardens because the idea <coughs> is that each little garden is a piece of a larger people's garden and that we're kind of all in it together. I'm sort of one and fuzzy that one. Uh, this is a group of kids I work with at East Central Lower Elementary School. Uh, this is a kindergarten class and this is their people's garden. And hey, these are my favorite kindergartners because the last time I went over and worked in their garden, one of the kids said, Dr. Coker, you're the bomb diggity. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, proof, I am awesome. <laughs> because kids, it, kindergartners don't know how to make up flattery. <laughs> and they are always so excited when we're doing garden projects. And they hug me, and they bring seeds from home, and they tell me about the plants of their grandmas. So excited. This is another group I work with. This is the Opal Smith Day Center. This is part of the Harrison County Mental Health Association. This is a drop-in center, and clients come four days a week. Um, they can choose to participate in programs or not. Uh, I've been doing horticulture therapy there for several years now. Um, so we built this garden, uh, planted some lettuce. So on the right there, that's our tiny little lettuces. This is what it grew into. But then what happened, sort of bothered me a little bit, because I said, How's the garden doing? And they said, great, come look at it. And that's what I found. I said, oh, this is beautiful. You know, how, how are you eating it? We don't know how to harvest it. We pulled a few out. So there was a little hole where they pulled a few out. I said, no, you just cut it off and it keeps growing back. No. <laughs> I forgot to tell them the next step. So they've been eating lettuce like crazy. Uh, I also do uh, a lot of talks on edible landscaping because uh, people are interested in how to incorporate uh, an environmentally friendly and nutritious uh, garden into their lifestyle. So that's a really fun topic. And I always talk about um, things that you can incorporate, like daylilies, totally edible. Uh, the plant on the right is an okra plant. Okra is actually in the hibiscus family. Tasty. Um, so I kind of sped through some of that, um, but I am totally open up for any discussion you have or whatever time.